The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to the Yaron Brook Show on this uh, Sunday, Sunday night. Appreciate you all joining me. I'm particularly pissed off today, so it should be a good show, right? Um, yeah, I, I was originally not going to talk about Afghanistan because I've talked about it pretty much every show so far, but uh, how could you not watching the pictures coming out of Kabul and, and reading what is going on in the world out there? There's just no way to stay silent about this. I have to rage against our political and military leaders once again. So we will talk about Afghanistan. Then we'll talk about the war on achievement in our schools. We'll attack, you know, we'll, it's, it's a depressing show today. Sorry. Maybe we'll do a Iran's Rules for Life, you know, uh, next show or something, just to, just to, to get, get your spirits up because th this one's going to be a downer. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, best friend Hank, thanks for get, uh, getting us off and, and uh, with the Super Chat and Dan B uh, in particular, that is incredibly generous and a really good question. And I promise I'll get to the question. Let me rant a little bit about Afghanistan, put it a little bit in context, and then try to answer your question. Um, so uh, as you know, if you want to ask me a question, Super Chat is open. Uh, $20 questions or higher get priority but I try to answer all the questions. Jonathan, thank you. Um, I appreciate I appreciate the sentiment and the support. Uh, and um, you, so you can use the Super Chat to support the show. Don't forget to like the show before you leave, of course, assuming you like the show. And of course, um, don't forget to support the show on a monthly basis. So today we're going to talk about those two things, Afghanistan and, and uh, the state of our schools too, you know, just wonderful topics to set the mood uh, for this end of a weekend and to set the context for a uh, successful and productive week for all of us. So um, anyway, so as you've probably seen in the news, uh, Kabul has fallen. The president of Afghanistan has fled the country. What a courageous guy going down with the ship. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the embassy is basically the U.S. embassy has basically been evacuated to the airport. 6,000 American troops are either on the way or they were ready to secure the airport, surround the airport, protect the airport, so that uh, the uh, embassy staff can be flown out of Kabul. Thousands of Afghans, interpreters, guides, people who worked for the Americans, people who were promised uh, that they would be kept safe by the American government, that they would be flown to America, that they would be provided visas. Many of them are now in the airport trying to find a way to escape, trying to get the Americans to live up to their promises. Uh, they, uh, they, 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 you know, we're not getting all the, all the information uh, because I, I, I think it's hard to get up-to-date information on what's going on in the airport itself. But uh, it, it's, it's pretty chaotic over there. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of Afghans panicking right now, panicking for their life. The only secure zone from the wrath of the Taliban is the airport. So far, the Taliban has not attacked American troops, partially as part of the, uh, quote, peace agreement that uh, the Trump administration signed with the Taliban last year and uh, and uh, that the Biden administration has uh, has supported throughout uh, the uh, we will see if uh, the evacuation goes smoothly and they're allowed to evacuate of course the airport is also being used to evacuate the uh, the uh, embassy staff of other western countries like that have troops and have embassy staff in Kabul whether it's the Danish the British um, and uh, even even the, some French I think have been evacuated, two planes of French have been evacuated tonight out of there. Uh, thousands, 
thousands of, of courageous Afghans who helped American troops, American journalists, that helped uh, Western forces over the last 20 years and who were promised over and over again very recently by the Biden administration, just last week by the Biden administration, that they would be uh, uh, securely uh, airlifted out of Afghanistan if the Taliban took over, that they would be protected by U.S. forces, that they would be provided with visas. Thousands of these people are being uh, are abandoned all over Afghanistan in territory that has already been occupied by the Taliban. There is an excellent article today published in, uh, the, uh, in the Atlantic magazine, PACA, by, by something Packer, uh, who, uh, you know, this day, this, this day and this decision by Biden will live in infamy. The abandonment, the, the, the betrayal of uh, Afghans who were supportive of the United States, who would have made good immigrants to the United States and have been completely deserted, abandoned, stabbed in the back for all that they helped any future allies of the United States around the world are watching this. Don't expect that if we ever get into trouble, if we ever need anybody's help, that they're going to provide it. Uh, Hugh James is waiting for you on to say it was Trump's fault. Of course it's Trump's fault and Biden's and Obama's and Bush's. It's all of their fault. But it is Trump who signed, quote, a peace agreement with the Taliban and actually invited them to uh, Camp David. Luckily, that didn't happen, but invited them to Camp David to sign the peace treaty. So yes, it's also, to a large extent, Trump's fault. This abandonment of everybody uh, is partially a result of the fact that our visa regime in the United States is so primitive, backwards, anti-immigration, that it makes it almost impossible to give these people uh, visas, get them out of their help them escape. Priorities now of the U.S. military, of course, is to get U.S. citizens and staff out as quickly as possible. And again, these people who helped us will be abandoned. In the meantime, Joe Biden is vacationing at Camp David. I'm sure he's getting regular updates from his staff, but he is not in the White House. He is in Camp David. Um, he supposedly is going to make a kind of statement to the nation, but what can he say? Um, I mean, the decision to leave Afghanistan, given that you're not going to win the war, is probably the right one. The complete and utter incompetence of U.S. military intelligence, of the political class, of the State Department, of the CIA, of every aspect and every part of the U.S. military and every part of the U.S. foreign policy, establishment in not being able to see that this was coming and not being able to predict that the Taliban would be so successful so quickly and in a, again abandoning our allies is just horrific and of course will not nobody there nobody in the White House nobody in our political class will take responsibility for any of it Nancy Pelosi brave courageous Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. That one's on Trump, right? Didn't When Trump was elected, Nancy Pelosi wasn't Speaker of the House. After two years of his presidency, she was. Okay, so that's on him. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, today issued a statement that began with the president is to be commended, commended for the clarity of purpose of his statement on Afghanistan and the actions he has taken. What actions has he taken? abandonment. I mean, you could leave Afghanistan and wipe out the enemy. You could leave Afghanistan and help your allies. You can leave Afghanistan under a variety of circumstances. Other than complete collapse, complete betrayal, complete chaos, complete disaster. So Nancy Pelosi, the president is to be commended for the clarity of his purpose of his statement on Afghanistan and the actions he has taken. Then she goes on to say, listen to this. We are deeply concerned about reports regarding the Taliban's brutal treatment of Afghans, especially women and girls. Are you now? 
the U.S. and the international community and the Afghan government. What government? The government has just fled to Tajikistan and who knows where from there. Maybe to the United States. Maybe we're protecting them. The U.S. and the international community and the Afghan government must do everything we can, everything we can. Everything we can do to protect women and girls from inhumane treatment by the Taliban. Really? You just said what Biden did was fine. You just commended him on evacuating, on leaving, on, on, on handing the country over to our enemy, to dedicated enemy, I'll get to who the Taliban is in a minute. People dedicated to, 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 to killing Americans, you just handed them the country. And now, now you're concerned about women and girls? And everything, we should do everything in our power? Well, everything in our power would be to blast these people into oblivion. But no, you don't support that. You support what the president has done. I mean, isn't that what we were in Afghanistan supposed to be for? Now, again, I'm not for us staying in Afghanistan if we're not going to win, but that's what the American troops have been doing, protecting women and girls for the last 20 years in Afghanistan. You just abandoned them. Okay, fine. We had to get out. But send, don't say, don't say, the U.S. and international community and the Afghan government must do everything we can to protect women and girls. We're not going to. Admit it. We've abandoned the women and girls in Afghanistan. And the Taliban can do whatever they want with them. We will do nothing to the Taliban if they do that. She continues, this deluded, delusional, evil woman. Any political sentiment that the Afghans pursue to avert bloodshed must include having women at the table. Oh, I'm sure the Taliban is going to have women at the table. There's no question that's going to be. But notice that she says, must. Who's going to force them? Who's going to do that? I mean, I'm sure the Taliban was listening. And they said, oh, Nancy Pelosi just said we must. She just said the U.S. and international community will do everything they can. So we better invite women to the table when we negotiate. Well, they're not negotiating. There's no settlement. The Taliban won. That's it. They won. They've taken over Afghanistan. There is no Afghan government other than the Taliban. They are the government. And they will do it with women and girls whatever they want. Which, and we know what they want. Not good for the women and girls. Horrific. Horrible. But just admit what you've done. Accept it. We don't want to be the policemen in Afghanistan anymore. We don't want to sacrifice for them. Okay? We recognize that this will bring about brutality and horror to the people of Afghanistan. We're sorry, but that's what it has to be. But no, we're going to continue to pretend. We're going to continue to pretend that we're somehow the good guys, that we're somehow going to save face, that we're going to protect the Afghan people, they were going to protect these girls and women. Just disgusting. Just disgusting. Michael F F Fitzgibbon, thank you. That, that's very generous. That got us to $400, you know, within like 15 minutes. It's kind of a record. Um, so, so thank you for the support. I really appreciate that. I will be getting to all these questions in a few minutes, I promise. Now, let's remind ourselves who the Taliban is. The Taliban, Taliban uh, it, it, it is, uh, comes from the word student. Um, it's the Arabic word for student, Talib. Talib is, is a, the reason they're called Taliban is the original Taliban were the students. A Mullah Omar, an Islamist, um, uh, radical Islamist, uh, militant Islamist, uh, Islamic totalitarian, however you want to call it, uh, who, who was teaching, uh, centered in Kandahar, uh, and who, uh, you know, who, who led, who was part of Mujahideen, the, the, the Islamists who fought 
against uh, the uh, Russian occupation, the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan in, uh, in uh, the early 1980s, supported by the CIA and supported the, by the United States. These young Afghans, who originally comprised of the Taliban, were all uh, Sunni students who studied uh, in Islamic schools, madrasas in Pakistan, after they fled Afghanistan. And then they coalesced around Mullah Omar, who was the brightest light, I guess, among these Islamic uh, scholars. In the 1990s, uh, when Afghanistan was in chaos after the, uh, after the uh, Soviets left and uh, there was uh, a huge, basically, civil war between rivaling gangs, rivaling tribes to try to control Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban coalesced in, in the area of Kandahar in the south of Pakistan, on the close to the uh, border with Pakistan. They were supported initially by the Pakistani government. You could argue that they were supported initially by the U.S. government. Um, and uh, Mullah Omar and the, and the Taliban uh, basically started a slow process of taking over control of Afghanistan. They started out uh, by seizing Kandahar in 1994 without a fight. Now remember, Afghanistan, up until that point, uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, had been a, you know, at least in Kabul, in, in, in its uh, capital, uh, fairly secular. You can see pictures online of life in Kabul during that time. Um, one of the reasons the Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan is that a communist government there that had been elected uh, ran into trouble and uh, called in the Soviets to help them out because of, uh, you know, uh, tribal warfare. So there had been a significant sector of the population that was secular and westernizing. Uh, but the Taliban, of course, uh, are a group committed to Sharia law, uh, ruling the state based on the laws of Sharia, based on the laws of the Quran. They don't tolerate uh, music. They don't tolerate women being uncovered. They do not tolerate any kind of secular notions. Women do not go to school. Um, and, uh, and of course, any secular, any secular country, any secular peoples, any secular approaches are the enemy. The enemy is secularism. Religion, the Islamic religion, is the guiding principle. Jihad is... Uh, you know, the most important thing one can do. If you listen to interviews with uh, some of the uh, Taliban, uh, they talk about the fact that they don't mind dying. The dying in the cause of jihad brings honor, sends you to heaven, basically. Um, by, so the 1984, they took Kandahar, which was their base. They slowly started to spread across uh, uh, Afghanistan. They had a lot of support in the rural areas, the more religious areas of Afghanistan, primarily in the south, the Pashtun area. Uh, the Pashtun is a large tribe that also encapsulates uh, most of northern Pakistan. So they had strong, heavy support in Pakistan, still to this day have and, and have always had. And uh, they took over Kabul in, on 27th of September 1996. They dragged out the former president, Muhammad Najibullah, from a United Nations office when they took over. They basically executed him after torturing him in public. All of this uh, was in public. Uh, the Taliban government, during, uh, from 1996, basically imposed the strictest interpretation of Sharia, established religious police, for the suppression of any so-called vice, music, television, popular pastimes such as kite flying were banned, girls' schools were closed, women were prevented from working and forced to wear all covering burqas in public. Taliban courts, religious courts, handed out extreme punishments, extreme like Saudi Arabia, chopping off hands for thieves, stoning to death women accused of adultery. By 1998, two years later, they controlled 80% of the country. 20% in the north were controlled by some people called the Northern Alliance, tribes that were fighting against them in the north. In 2001, 
they blew up 1,500-year-old giant statues of Buddha in, in, uh, in one of the valleys in Afghanistan. They were basically dedicated to the destruction of any non-Islamic symbols, sites, temples, anything, uh, any archaeological, of any archaeological importance. It didn't matter if it was non-Muslim, it was blown up. Mullah Omar lived in a fancy house in Kandahar, a house supposedly built for him by Osama bin Laden. Now, of course, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda had helped the Taliban gain control of Afghanistan. They had also helped uh, the Mujahideen in the 1980s fight the, uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union. And Mullah Omer and Osama bin Laden became uh, good friends. They shared an ideology. They shared a hatred of the West. They shared a hatred of secularization. And the Taliban had allowed al-Qaeda to establish uh, training camps uh, in Afghanistan, training camps that were known to the United States uh, all over Afghanistan. Indeed, I think it was after the sinking, or not the sinking, the bombing of a U.S. Um, of a US vessel, a U.S. Uh, Navy vessel off the coast of Yemen, uh, I think in 1999 or in 2000, the United States actually lobbed some uh, missiles into one of bin Laden's camps in Afghanistan, uh, of course, doing nothing, just, just it, 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 you know, caused a little bit of uh, uh, sand to go up into the air. Uh, but the U.S. was very well aware of the training camps, very, very well aware of, of bin Laden's activities uh, in Afghanistan, but of course did nothing about it, even as bin Laden was attacking U.S. interests all over the world. In um, 2001, after 9-11, when it became clear that 9-11 was caused by bin Laden, uh, and Al-Qaeda, that it was uh, that the plan was hatched in Afghanistan and deployed from Afghanistan. Uh, the Taliban were given an ultimatum by uh, by George W. Bush, hand over bin Laden or we will uh, depose you, whatever you call it. Um, of course, the Taliban did not hand over bin Laden. The United States uh, in December of 2001 basically assisted with the Northern Alliance, brought in special forces troops, ultimately brought in four ground troops into Afghanistan, wiped the Taliban or, or uh, you know, threw the Taliban away from power. Taliban government fell. They, they, uh, they fled into the mountains. They fled into hiding. Many of them fled to Pakistan. They took with them uh, the remnants of Al Qaeda. The United States... Uh, while, while bombing and, and, and defeating them, treated them much with kid gloves, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, often uh, when they could have killed Mullah Omar or bin Laden or any of the leadership of the Taliban refrained because these people knew that if they traveled with civilians, the United States would keep them off. Now, the Taliban since then has been fighting an insurgency against the United States, against the Afghan government, against uh, the NATO troops that have been in Afghanistan. Uh, well over 2,000 American troops have died. During this insurgency, I, I uh, reviewed the movie The Outpost uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, which illustrates the lack of commitment of the United States to fight the Taliban, lack of commitment of the United States to actually defeat them, lack of commitment of the United States to actually win the war, lack of commitment to the United States to eradicate the threat that the Taliban posed, and a complete willingness of the political and military class in the United States to abandon its own troops, sacrificing them on the altar of buying and gaining the favor and the hearts and minds of, Pac of Afghanistan we treated Pakistan, who was clearly helping the Taliban and helping al-Qaeda. We treated them with kick gloves, did nothing to them, refused to defeat them, refused to even engage with them. Indeed, we supplied them with weapons and treated them as if they were allies all the time. They were hiding bin Laden and helping the Taliban and helping to kill as many troops as possible. Our military acted in a disgraceful way towards its own troops. Our generals should have all been fired. The last 20 years in Afghanistan is a, you know, tragedy of American 
uh, you know, we could have gone there. We could have destroyed Al Qaeda. We could have killed Bin Laden in the first few minutes after uh, after we decided we were going in. We could have devastated the Taliban. We could have uh, uh, destroyed their capacity to wage war, and we could have left and said to them, every time we see a Al Qaeda base in your territory, any time we suspect a terrorist activity coming out of Afghanistan, we're coming back, and we're going to destroy and kill as many of you as possible. And we'll keep doing that until you stop. That would have saved 2,000 plus American lives. And maybe the Afghans would have learned a lesson and turned against the Taliban. But no, instead, we went in, we deployed troops, we trained the Afghan army, we pretended to ourselves and to the Afghans that these troops could defend Afghanistan against the Taliban, that the troops actually believed in what they were fighting for. We supported politicians. We threw about a trillion, trillion with a T, dollars into this, into Afghanistan. And we were forced to leave anyway. We were going to leave. We should have left to begin with. We were forced to leave anyway, but this time, not as winners, not as victors, not as destroyers of our enemies. But we were forced to leave with the tail between our legs, defeated, crushed, abandoning our allies with the blood of the people the Taliban kills now on our hands. The Taliban won this last round because there was no opposition. The Afghan military folded. It was not going to fight and die to protect what? What did the Afghan government represent other than corruption? What were they fighting for? What was the vision? What was the ideal? What was the purpose? Americans weren't going to help them. Americans had abandoned them. So they just wouldn't, they just walked away. Says I wouldn't go that far, blood on our hands. I'd say the blood of the people who helped us that we promised to get out of there is on our hands. And the fact that we didn't defeat and crush and destroy the Taliban when we had a chance, when we had a reason to, when we had the opportunity, when we had every moral right to do so, here they are again, blood on our hands. In 2018, the Trump administration began to street discreet talks with the Taliban in Doha, in the United Arab Emirates. The idea was to cut a deal so that the United States could leave, cut a deal with the Taliban, cut a deal with the people who were killing American troops on the ground, cut a deal with the people who are committed to the destruction of everything we believe in, cut a deal with the people who harbored 9-11 terrorists, who harbored Al-Qaeda for years and years and years, kind of deal with the people who are clearly our enemies. Maybe not a very dangerous enemy, but our enemy. But that's Trump. That's pragmatism. That's all of these people. The talks were interrupted several times because American troops were being attacked and killed by the Taliban. Sorry, Doha is in Qatar. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, fixing that. In February... 29, 2020, a historical deal was signed between the U.S. and the Taliban. Indeed, Trump was going to invite the Taliban to Camp David to sign the deal. Unimaginable. The stupidity and anti-Americanism of that man. And then, of course, Biden came And he said, "Ah, I'm committed to the same goal. I'm committed to getting our troops out of Afghanistan. And he actually did it. He did it. (laughs) He did what Trump and Obama could not do. And here, uh, U.S. military intelligence assessments have been so pathetic. (laughs) So pathetic. Biden's weakness has been so pathetic. 
The betrayal has been so pathetic. <sighs> I mean, it'll be interesting to see if Biden pays a political price for this. I mean, the American people are sick and tired of the war in Afghanistan, justifiably so. It's a war that we're committed not to winning, and therefore it's a war that we must stop and end. The American people don't seem to really care about what happens there. I mean, the left, some on the left are turning against Biden. You can see that in the papers, and in, in, in particularly the media. The media feels betrayed because they feel like they betrayed their sources in Afghanistan, people they promised to help evacuate, and the Biden administration did not do it. I mean, the stupidity and hypocrisy and just sheer... Uh, of Nancy Pelosi's statement. Yeah, best friend Hank says, I'm sick of politicians. Sick is an understatement. I, I think many people will see through that. But does anybody care? Does it really matter? I mean, they do this to the American people, in a sense, on a regular basis. Nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to want to do anything. Nobody seems to want to force them to making a, 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 you know, to actually uh, uh, paying a political price. Afghanistan, after all, is the burial ground of empires. It's where Alexander the Great was stopped. It is where the British were defeated. It's where the mighty Soviet Union was defeated. And now, as predicted 20 years ago, I predicted it. Many people predicted it. It is the place in which the United States has been defeated. I predicted it not because it's Afghanistan. I predicted it because there was no will to win. We lost in Iraq. We lost in Syria, whatever the hell that, you know, I'm not sure we were even there. I mean, to the extent that we were there. And now we've lost in Afghanistan. And we didn't do what we're supposed to do, which is convey a clear message to the Islamist a clear message to the people who want to kill us, a clear message to the terrorists among them, a clear message to the jihadists that we will not tolerate, that we will destroy them if they try to hurt us. That's the real loss. That's the sense in which your rights are being violated. That's the sense in which this is bad news for Americans. But plus the fact that nobody's ever going to trust us again. All right. So, I mean, it's a, it's a dead story. It's now just a question of, of the humiliation of getting our people out. It's now just a question of how long it'll take to, to, to you know, get everybody out of the airport. It's a question of whether the Taliban will stand down and let 6,000 American troops defend that airport and get the planes off the ground or whether they will. I, my guess is they'll let it happen. They've won. Let all the foreigners leave. I don't think they mind that so much. And it's a time to mourn for the Afghan people, and it's a time to mourn for the United States of America. We have lost it. No self-esteem, no self-respect. It's just being downhill from a foreign policy perspective. Downhill from a military perspective since World War II. We've had no basic foreign policy since World War II. All right. I'm going to take a quick look at the uh, Super Chat questions here and see the ones that are relevant to our discussion today. Um, all right. I have to take Dan, Dan B's question. It's a $100 question. Hi, Iran. I'm in dim hypothesis. Peacock predicts one trigger of a transformation to an M2 America. Maybe growing anger from America's police and military forces. Do you see what is going on in Afghanistan and the lawlessness in American cities furthering this prediction? No, well, not Afghanistan. In the streets of America, yes, but not Afghanistan. And not Afghanistan because the American military is, is, is part and parcel. Now, there might be elements within the American military that are really upset. Um, there might be elements within the, the American military that, uh, that think we should have fought this war to win 
and could have won it a long time ago, and that might feel betrayed by what's just happened. But the people in command, the generals, the, 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 the commanders, a part and parcel of the problem. They have been part of the problem forever. They are. So I, I don't see it in the military. I, I, I think the military, I think the, the, the disgust in the military will come from what's going on within American cities. But again, uh, you know, General Miley, I mean, they're teaching uh, critical race theory at West Point. Now, the lawlessness in American cities, I think, is different. I think the more lawlessness we get in American cities, the more the police, the military, and, and generally what I call the M2 right, will uh, uh, you know, be more and more committed to, um, to authoritarianism, to bringing peace and order to America. I mean, uh, often authoritarianism rises is a response to uh, a deterioration in peace and order. And so I, I, I do think lawlessness, violent crime rising, if we get many more demonstrations, burning down of cities, things like we saw last summer on a larger scale, continuous, ongoing, we're not seeing it yet. Partially, I mean, even in Portland, Oregon, uh, to a large extent, the, 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 the writing has petered out. The, there's writing fatigue among the left. They, you know, they, they're not, there's only so many nihilists you can get together at any given point in time to do this kind of stuff. And uh, at some point, you can round them up and, 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 and it's gone. It's over uh, pretty quickly. So I, I, I don't think it'll come from foreign conflict as much as it'll come in Tolini. Now, if, it, if, if we turn around and suddenly we have a, a large number of terrorist attacks in the United States and we have a president or, or we have a Congress or we have a, a, a significant portion of the American people don't want to do anything about it, sitting on their hands, and the military and security situation for us starts deteriorating dramatically, then you could see the military stepping in. Then you could see the military saying, enough is enough. We have to, in the name of defending America, in the name of defending our interests, we have to rid ourselves of this ridiculous uh, uh, ruling class, governing class that is abandoning and, and, and stabbing the United States in the back. Uh, let me look. Um, Andrew asks, was Biden's statement on America not being responsible for Afghanistan a rational application of national self-interest? Uh, it could be if it was stated by the right person under the right circumstances in the right context, but in the mouth of Biden, it certainly is not. Biden voted for the war. What for? What was the war for? for the protection of American national interests, supposedly. What did that entail? That entailed destroying the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and their presence there. It is true that America is not responsible for Afghanistan. It shouldn't be responsible for Afghanistan. That is consistent with national self-interest. But we are responsible for not allowing Afghanistan to become a haven for terrorists like the ones who attacked us on 9-11. We are responsible, our national self-interest is applicable to destroying and wipe, to the extent that we can, and I think we can, the Taliban and its power base, whoops, and its ability to do what it does. All right, what's going on? Do we still have internet? Are you guys still there? Somebody in the chat, say you're still there. Okay, we're still here. Good, power went out. Um, it's, uh, we've got a tropical storm outside, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, power often gets out. Luckily, we have a generator in the building. I think what you saw was that uh, my, uh, my, uh, everything's on, uh, everything crucial to running a show is on battery power. So if the, if the power goes out, my batteries kick in, uh, and if the internet's still running, 
then uh, I just have to wait for the generator in the building to kick in and we're fine. And that's what happened. Everything worked the way it's supposed to work. I love it when that happens. I love it when that happens. Um, let's see. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, self-interest. So Biden wouldn't know American self-interest if it bit him in the face. I mean, what, what, he, he, he doesn't know what that is. American self-interest wouldn't have involved uh, 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 the United States staying in Afghanistan for 20 years, but it would have involved destroying the Taliban and making it clear that if they rose to power again, I mean, he, he should have, instead of negotiating in Doha, him and Trump, they should have told the Taliban, okay, you can have, Pakistan, you can have Afghanistan, but if we see, if we get any hint that there is a... a um, a, uh, what do you call it, a, a, a terrorist, an Al-Qaeda terrorist plotting against the United States on Afghanistan soil, we're going to destroy everybody in the government. We're going to kill you all. Yeah, you should have said that publicly, not just in private, publicly. Um, do you think the same situation would be underway if Trump was in power instead of Biden? Um, yes, absolutely. I, I see no difference in terms of uh, the military, in terms of the intelligence assessment, in terms of the behavior. Uh, Trump was as committed, if not more committed, to getting the troops out of Afghanistan. I see zero difference. Ultimately, this is all a consequence of a deal that Trump signed with the Taliban. So, no, I, 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 the, the incompetence is not uniquely Biden. Uh, Biden's particularly weak, but so is Trump when it came to foreign policy. Trump was you know, one of the weakest presidents we've ever had. So, no, no reason to think this would, uh, this would be any different under, uh, under uh, Trump. Uh, Michael uh, Fitzgibbon, uh, thank you again for that very generous contribution. My understanding is that the United States has committed to defend Taiwan from a Chinese takeover. Is that true? If so, should the U.S. keep that commitment? Uh, yes, it's absolutely true. I mean, it's more than a commitment. It's a treaty. There's a treaty between the United States and Taiwan that the United States will protect it from uh, Chinese invasion, even as the United States has um, basically doesn't recognize Taiwan as a, as a legitimate political entity, right? We don't have an embassy. We don't have a consulate. We have a library, a library. That's how strong the United States is. That's how tough the United States is with China. We won't, because the Chinese demand it, we won't even have an embassy in Taiwan, and that was true, uh, and, and that's been true since the late 1970s. Uh, should we? I mean, that's a tricky question. Uh, certainly, in the face of Chinese aggression, now is not the time to withdraw from such a commitment. If the United States actually had articulated a foreign policy of self-interest, a proper foreign policy of self-interest, if the United States had properly viewed the world and constructed a proper view of the world and created alliances around a proper foreign policy, then no, we should not have a commitment to defend Taiwan against China. I mean, I could see a number of different alliances, for example, being formed. We could have encouraged an alliance between South Korea, Japan, two enemies, but we could have bridged that, and Taiwan for mutual self-protection. We could have done a lot of different things foreign policy-wise and supported them, funded them, uh, weaponized them, and of course recognized them as a sovereign country, which would be a nice beginning to give them some moral courage to stand up to the Chinese. Um, but I don't think the United States should go around the world giving, uh, in a sense, uh, a, a, we will defend you at all costs. Because the fact is we won't. Today, I think everybody knows we won't. And, and I don't think we should. Right? It, it, goes, it goes back to should we, should we be in a position where we're willing to defend Estonia from a Russian invasion because Estonia is part of NATO? Would, would you be willing to send your son to fight for Estonian independence because Russia is invaded? I don't think so. I don't think so. All right, let's see. Other questions about Afghanistan. Uh, Joe asks, how much do you think the rise of moral relativism has impacted the Middle East situation? 
it seems like the culture at large and politicians don't call evil as evil, and it's pretty hard to kill people you, who might be good. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think the, the rise of moral relativism, the right, but not just moral relativism, the, the, the dominance of altruism in our culture prevents us from defending ourselves, prevents us from being self-interested, prevents us from having an actual America first foreign policy, uh, prevents us from doing what's right and for fighting wars the way they should be fought. Moral relative is one aspect of that, and altruism is another aspect of that. Uh, and, and that has made it much worse. The last president to, to call somebody evil was Ronald Reagan. And he was lamb blasted by the press and by the intellectuals, by everybody when he did so. He called uh, the Soviet Union the evil empire. But no, nobody would do that today. I mean, George Bush did that. He, he talked about an axis of evil. Right? An axis of evil. What was it? Iran and uh, North Korea, but uh, maybe I, I can't remember who else was on the axis of evil. So it happens once in a while, right? But even then, what do you do about evil? How do you fight evil? But yes, uh, part of the issue is not only the issue of them being evil, but it's also the question of are we good? What are we fighting for? Who are we fighting for? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and, and that, there's been no coherent view in terms of foreign policy. There's no foreign policy of self-interest being advocated. They're the realists who are, you know, who, are, who will negotiate with anybody. This is, this is Trump groveling before North Korea. You know, that's realist. It's... it's uh, it's Kissinger signing a peace deal with the, with, uh, the North Vietnamese. It's, it's Bush and, and Biden groveling before the Taliban. That's what realists do. You realize that good guys and bad guys in the world and you've got to deal with anybody. It's pure pragmatism. And then there's like the neocons who, oh, the, 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 the fire, the, the, the desire for freedom is burning in everybody's heart. We just need to give them a little push and they'll all be freedom fighters and they'll all establish wonderful liberal democracies all over the world. And neither of those views are true. Both of them assume a, a, a kind of altruism. But what we need is a, is a real foreign policy of, uh, of self-interest. And the closest we come to articulating that, other than Ayn Rand's work, there's a book by Peter Schwartz uh, on the foreign policy of self-interest. And then there's, uh, there's Ilan Jono's uh, book, uh, Winning the Unwinnable War, which I think articulates Three essays by me where we try to articulate a, a, a foreign policy of, of self-interest. And I've done so on this show over and over and over again over the years uh, trying to do that. Uh, but again, nobody listens. I, I predicted what just happened in Afghanistan over and over and over again over the years. Nobody cares. No, I mean, nobody listens. A handful of you listen, but that's about it. Unfortunately, you guys have no influence. Sorry to break that to you, but it seems like you have no influence. Uh, Thessy says, Pelosi goes with whatever's popular or keeps her on the good side of her party. Can he talk about more times she has been an utter hypocrite? I don't like, well, you know, the hairdresser. I mean, there are a million times. The, the press is very good at pointing out hypocrisy. I'm not particularly interested in hypocrisy. And my quote from Pelosi was not primarily focused on her hypocrisy. It was on the sheer evil of what we, she was saying. We will do everything we can. To stop this, what are you talking about? That's just, you're just lying. You're not being a hypocrite. You are just lying. Oh, we hope that the Taliban invites women and girls to negotiate, to, to be part of the governing coalition. Really? That's just delusional. You're just putting on a front. It's not hypocrisy. It's just, so she's hypocritical a, a, a all the time. She's evil. She's, she's an evil woman. But that's not her main sin. Hypocrisy generally is, is, is not the main sin of bad people. The main sin of bad people is that bad ideas. And by the way, if you have bad ideas, you have to be a hypocrite. Because to live, you have to do something good. You produce or you, you have to live off of people who produce. So everybody who have bad ideas, all altruists, all collectivists, are hypocrites. 
But pointing out the hypocrisy is not that interesting. Brian asks, what odds do you give the Afghan people to rising up when they see the contrast between rule of law and rule of the book? Almost zero. It's very difficult to rise up. I mean, what, you will see a civil war. I'm not saying nobody will rise up. You will see some rising up. So, you know, the Northern Alliance, the, the, the warlords will rise up. Remember what they've had is not really the rule of law. They've had a very corrupt government. Yes, it, it's been better than the Taliban. But they don't have the commitment to ideas. They don't have a commitment to a different point of view, to a different uh, kind of life. You saw the Afghan military just folding, and they fold like that because they don't really believe in anything. They don't really trust their government. They don't really trust their future. So I don't see the rising up other to protect tribal interests. So you might see the tribes in the north who are not Pashtun, who are not affiliated with the Taliban and never have been, rising up uh, to, uh, you know, in a sense, um, lead a, a, a mini civil war against the Taliban. It won't be effective, just like it won't, wasn't effective before 2001. Now, at some point, one would hope that Afghan people would become less and less cooperative with the Taliban, and maybe the Taliban will become weaker and weaker over time. But it, it's going to take a long time. And of course, the people who are going to fight the Taliban are going to be these warlords, these tribal leaders who are not that much better from the Afghan people's perspective than the Taliban. Um, you know, one of the reasons the Taliban seems to always win in, in, in the 90s and now is because they promise peace and stability. They promise an escape from civil war. They promise an escape from bloodshed, a rule of Law, I mean, bad law, but law. And people prefer that to anarchy. Whoops. People prefer bad law to anarchy. All right, Andrew asks, if the United States has responded to 9-11 egoistically, would it have significantly changed the trajectory of U.S.-China-Russia relations? Yes. Dramatically so. Dramatically so. I mean, the response of the United States to 9-11 lost us the respect of our enemies, lost us the respect of China and Russia. And then if you, you know, you can't divorce that from what happened in the financial crisis. So if you combine 9-11 and the financial crisis, those two events basically demolished the idea of the United States as a shining city on a hill, as a place to be emulated, as the, 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 the capitalist haven that stands for freedom um, is, you know, it's a great tragedy of that decade, that decade under George W. Bush, the, 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 another Republican president, I despised with all my being, right? He failed with, with the financial crisis and he failed with 9-11 and that has led us to where we are. That has resulted in the Obama uh, Trump Biden, uh, you know, uh, trilogy of pathetic presidents. And uh, that's all a consequence of the Bush presidency and the Bush failures. And it's resulted in the rise and the uh, rise in confidence of Russia and China in opposing the United States. And, and I think it, it resulted in the, uh, in the um, rise in confidence of Iran. Iran what is it, 1979, it's, it's over 40 years since, um, you know, since uh, the Iranian Revolution. And they're still around. The people hate them. People in Tehran hate them. And yet they're still around. And, and that has only been made possible by American weakness. Not that I think we necessarily need to push them off, but our strength would have emboldened the opposition in Iran. Our strength would have emboldened the opposition in Russia. Our strength would have emboldened the pro-liberal, liberal in the positive sense, pro-liberty people within China. Our weakness has done exactly the opposite. The one country nobody wants to emulate now is America. Nobody wants to emulate now is America. Uh, Joe asked, the fact that we keep losing these pointless wars is more bloody evidence that the moral is the practical and these were not moral causes. 
And yeah, true, but the difference in Afghanistan is it could have been a moral cause. Vietnam was never a moral cause. But but um, Afghanistan and, 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 and Iran and Iraq could have been executed right, focused right, done ruthlessly quickly. And that's the tragedy, that there was reason to engage in them. The reason was 9-11. But we lost any connection to that and became altruistic, pointless, immoral wars. And yes, you're right. The immoral is the impractical when you fight an immoral war for immoral, by immoral means for immoral ends, you lose. What would have been a more honorable way to pull out? <laughs> um, basically, you know, find all the bases in which the all the bases in which the Taliban leaders are and bomb them into oblivion. Uh, set the Taliban back in terms of militarily. So, so do it primarily from the air, so you don't take too many American casualties. But go in there and just devastate them. Uh, uh, kill as many Taliban troops, but uh, many leaders, political leaders, you know, they, they're all in Doha, assassinated them all. All these uh, Taliban people who came to negotiate with the Americans, put them on trial for treason, for crimes against humanity. Take them to the Hague, let the Europeans deal with them, right? Treat them the way they deserve and then say, look, we've done what we can. Uh, the Taliban you know, is on the defensive, they're retreating. Um, if ever Afghanistan becomes a, a place uh, for terrorists, we will destroy them. By the way, anybody in Afghanistan who um, has helped the United States and friend of the United States, who wants to emigrate to the United States, let's go, let's get you quick visas, stamp your passports, get you out of here, and then, and then leave. But leave from a position of strength, Leave after having crushed, to the extent that you can, the remnant, you know, the, the, the Taliban in its bases and where they are. Landon Wall says the treaty with Taiwan ended in 1970. Interesting. I'll have to, I'll, I, then I've been, I've been wrong on that for a long time because I, 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 I thought we still had a treaty. I will look into that and, uh, and see what our commitments vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan are if we have any, if we, if we don't, and that's particularly interesting because then there's no question we won't defend Taiwan. Uh, but let me, thanks Landon. Uh, always good to have somebody fact check the Iran book show and not like others, I will actually go and check and if I'm wrong, I'll admit it. Um, so that would be a more honorable way to pull out. Derek, Derek, thank you. That's a, a very generous uh, contribution. To what extent, uh, let me hold off on that one, Derek. I want to see if there are any other ones. Uh, when will Dr. Fauci officially denounce the super spread event in Kabul? <sighs> I don't know. I can't laugh at that. Sorry. It's, it's, just, it's just too tragic to laugh at. Um, why do you think people feel so strong? Most, why do you think people feel most strongly about promoting freedom abroad while actively ending, eroding it at home. Do you think they realize it or connect the two? Is it altruism or something else? Well, no, I, I think it's the fact that they don't have a clue what freedom is. They think the mixed economy is freedom. They think democracy, majority rule democracy is freedom. They, they have no conception of freedom as individual rights, freedom as limited government, freedom as uh, the protection from force and coercion. They have no conception of freedom in those terms. Freedom to them is whatever the people want. As long as there are elections, they're happy. So, it's, it's a, so they, they, they don't demand it at home. I mean, they do in a sense. They, they think what we have today at home is freedom. I mean... It's not like the neocons or the internationalist left think that they're destroying freedom at home and they don't mind. They, they don't think they're destroying it at home. They think freedom is at home is fine, is doing well. Uh, Thomas Schubert asks, are you familiar with the book This Kind of War by T.S. Fahrenbach? 
It is a history of the Korean War, but its finer chapters contain some very interesting commentary on foreign policy and military strength. No, I'm not familiar with it. It sounds really interesting. Um, you know, that is the war that um, got General um, MacArthur fired because he wanted to actually win it, and Truman wouldn't let him win it. And uh, that led to Truman firing um, MacArthur after MacArthur won the war in the Pacific. MacArthur, like Patton, was a general who knew exactly how you win, and he was not allowed to win Korea. And as a consequence, uh, he actually thought of running for president against Truman, and uh, Truman fired him partially to protect himself politically, but also to because he didn't want to fight the way MacArthur wanted to fight. Okay, let's see. So I'm going to take a couple of questions here. Let's, let's do this. Uh, Derek asks, hey, Iran, to what extent did Elon Musk fit as a modern-day Hank Reardon, i.e. a genius engineer who holds different values in his work life than he does outside of his work life, but this is still essentially good. Looking forward to saying hi at Ocon. Um, it's hard. It's hard. We know so much about the inner life of Hank Reardon. We know so much about the innocent acceptance of bad philosophy by Hank Reardon. How innocent is Elon Musk? I don't know. He's probably read Atlas Shrugged. Is he innocent after reading Atlas Shrugged? Um, the fact that so many of his businesses post PayPal are businesses that are tied to government contracts, government subsidies, that he structures it in his entrepreneurial Focus on things that required government support, Tesla being the most obvious. I mean, I can understand why that would be for SpaceX, but Tesla, I don't really. His political statements, they're sometimes very good and sometimes just, just awful and horrific. I, I don't think he quite rises to a, a, a modern-day Hank Reardon, as much as I'd like him to be, as much as I'd like him to do, be. Uh, Jeffrey asks, are you aware of the state of restaurants vis-a-vis -vis staffing? I am, actually. <laughs> Just recently became aware, not in New York, where you are, but in Puerto Rico. Every chef I know is running a skeleton crew, including me. I know. Can't recall last day off. I'm worried extra unemployment will be extended. Still waiting to feed you. Yes, I'm still waiting. Oh, I've got dates. Oh, can I make a reservation? Are you guys, uh, Jeffrey, are you open on Mondays? What day, are, are you open on Sunday and Monday? Let me know if you open on those two days. Um, yes, um, in Puerto Rico at least, this is, so this is my first end experience in Puerto Rico, I was, I was speaking to a guy who runs it, it, just a bagel store um, down here. And, um, you know, he makes his own bagels and uh, he's, got a, he's got a good business and he had a good, a good business during COVID because he was, shipping them out to a very wealthy neighborhood um, uh, uh, outside of San Juan. And he was doing, and so I asked him, are you still shipping bagels to that neighborhood? He said, no, I can't get the staff. I can't produce enough bagels. I don't have enough people working for me. I can barely keep the shop open. I have to, he used to stay open until early evening, until afternoon. Now he closes right after kind of lunchtime. He does breakfast, lunch, and he closes. Um, and so he, um, He, you know, he can't find any staff, and he keeps complaining that he, he's that now the the Puerto Rican extended unemployment ends at the end of this month. So he's hoping that changes, but he doesn't know, and, and and he's not sure, and he's not sure what the quality of the work is. The other thing he says is, well, this is the thing: the best workers have multiple job offers. The people who are on employment now are not the best workers. They're going to come on. They're going to come back. And how are we going to get anybody decent? Then tonight, I was at one of my favorite restaurants, one of my two, favorite, two, two three favorite restaurants on the island. And we know the chef and his wife who, who manages the front of the house. And, and she was saying how difficult it is for them to get staffing, that they're working nonstop, um, even now during a tropical storm because they, they can't, they don't have any duplication. They don't have anybody. So they're there all the time. 
uh, some uh, another chef, a, a, a pretty a really well trained chef, um, has tried to open a restaurant in San Juan. Somebody with amazing credentials in terms of working at the top restaurants, um, and just can't find the staff. So he landed up opening a wine bar with a limited menu, and even at the wine bar with a limited menu, they can't find enough workers to work. And you know, there's a huge demand right now for service products. We've been locked up. We want to go to restaurants. We want to go to bars. We want to go to places and, 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 and service. And people don't want to go to the work. They're getting paid by the government they, to stay home. And, and when they, you know, they can demand more and more of that, they haven't had to pay rent. The, the demands on their pocketbook have been limited. Um, and it's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting whether they ever go back to work or how they go back to work or who goes back to work. And, and, um, it's, it's devastating. So I, 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 you know, I, I understand Jeffrey, how horrible that is. And it's, it's a consequence of government policy. I mean, the economy opened up and the workers didn't show up. They are more job openings. I read this in the, I read this recently. There are more job openings in the United States right now than at any point in recorded history, that at any point where this has been tracked. The more job opening, and, and by the way, the other aspect of this, can I add another aspect of this that some of you won't like, is the lack of immigration. The lack of immigration. Usually there's a sudden flow of certain number of illegal immigrants and, and a significant number of legal immigrants that flow into the country that fill many of these jobs. That is, to a large extent, uh, being, uh, being halted. Being halted. Um, all right, Jeffrey, can I make a reservation? Uh, it's just going to be me, um, I, unless I can find somebody to join me, but it's just going to be me on um, September 12th. September 12th. And make it relatively late, because I'm not sure when my flight is going to get into New York. I'll, I'll have to work on that. But if you can get me down, that, that would be amazing. Amazing. That would be so much fun. All right. Uh, and, and, uh, so send me an email with, with, with some kind of confirmation. We're, I'm making restaurant reservations in the Iran Book Show. You can, too. You should all go eat at Jeffrey's. Um, uh, everything I've read about the restaurant, just my type of food, and it's going to be fantastic, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Yuan needs a date, that's right. Um, so the staffing issue is a huge problem. It's not just in, it's not just in restaurants. It's across the United States. Uh, there is a massive uh, shortage in workers. And, um, you know, we will, uh, we'll, see what, we'll see how it all plays out. But it's, it's devastating to the U.S. economy. It's devastating to, to, to economic growth. And what we need is more immigrants. If Americans won't do the jobs, bring in the immigrants. You know, open up the borders. But that won't happen. I mean, uh, 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 Trump restricted uh, H-1Bs and, and uh, legal immigration significantly. Obviously restricted illegal immigration significantly. Biden has continued basically most of Trump's policies. Uh, just maybe less competently on the southern border, but, uh, but basically uh, same policies. So we're not, we're seeing real shortages of workers in the U.S., which is bizarre and really kind of ridiculous. Okay, Seth has a, I, I might, I, I think I'm not going to get to the war and achievement. We'll have to do that next time. You know, Afghanistan took up much more time than I thought it would in your questions. Of course, they're taking up, I, you can continue asking questions. We've still got some time for questions, but uh, the one achievement will be, and the one achievement is basically gonna be a discussion of how the left is trying to destroy any sense of achievement in our schools and, and what that entails and, and how that's playing out. So we'll talk about that. Uh, immigrants don't just go on welfare. Indeed, most immigrants can't get welfare, but immigrants don't go on welfare. 99% of immigrants get jobs. Many of them are entrepreneurs. Uh, they work harder than many Americans. Uh, most immigrants, you know, and if you made them legal, they'd all work. 
people don't come to America to get on warfare. It's not the motivation. Uh, Seth asks, what is the proper time in one's life to get a financial advisor and what criteria should I use to select one? I'm in my mid-30s and have various retirement trading crypto accounts that I have been managing myself. I'd say... Uh, I mean, this is the issue about advisors. The main job of an advisor is to keep you from doing stupid things. The main job of an advisor is to walk you away from the cliff. It's to prevent you from putting all your money in Bitcoin. It's to prevent you from taking all your money out when the market de declines. It's to make sure that you're well diversified. If you can do that yourself, you don't need an advisor because you don't need to pay the fee. So what I would recommend is very simple. Diversify across asset classes. Uh, use very, very low fee ETFs or, or kind of index funds to do it. Diversify internationally. Have a little bit, if you want, in crypto. Have a little bit in gold. And have the rest diversify in stock markets. If you're in your 30s, you shouldn't be in bonds. And, and just do that. And if you want to play money, if you want to trade, take 5% of what you have and play around with it, be ready to lose it. The point in which you need an advisor is the point in which you don't want to deal with that hassle. You don't trust yourself to do the right thing when the pressure hits. You're not sure how to access cheap ETFs or, or, or mutual funds or index funds. Um, but it's mainly an issue of trusting yourself. If you can withstand the downturns, if you're not going to buy into putting all your money into Enron, or into Bitcoin, or into one asset, if you can hold on to the diversification, if you can play it out long term, if you don't need somebody to hold your hand, then you don't need a financial advisor. Um, if you do, there are a number of financial advisors who support the Iran Book Show. Uh, if you email me, I can give you their names and, and uh, you know, happy to uh, make an introduction. Usually, you'd have to have, I don't know, uh, savings of, uh, I don't know, a few hundred thousand dollars to make it worth their while to, 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 to do it. But we can, I can help out. Uh, all right. Let's see. Okay, uh, Ryan asks, it's related to the topic of Afghanistan. He says, I rewatched your 2004 speech on the morality of war. It rings true today, considering Afghanistan today. Yeah, I am mean, it rang true in 2004. And, it, it, you know, everybody should watch that talk because not to be too boastful, everything I say there plays out. It's just right and true. And... At least, I think the one you watched, there is one from 2004. I gave it at the Air Force Intelligence Academy. I gave it at the military. There were all military people there. There was a general in the audience. Nobody listens. Nobody seems to care. It's, it's so depressing. So depressing. When, 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 yeah, you can see it. You tell them. They don't care. Ari asks, aid to Afghanistan is often compared to the Marshall Plan. The latter is considered successful in helping rebuild Europe after World War II, but Afghanistan is considered a disaster. Why do you think that is? Well, there are at least two reasons, two big reasons. One, Afghanistan had no tradition no intellectual um, source for ideas of liberty and freedom. These are foreign, difficult, uh, hard for them. And money is not going to do it. It's not about money. It wasn't about money in Europe either, but it's not about money. So there's no basis for it. You, what, you, what you would need in Afghanistan if you were really about changing the country 
is you would need to basically take over the educational institutions. You would need to actually rule the country, not have a puppet, not have a ridiculous Afghan corrupt government. You would have to rule the country. And you would actually have to start educating a new generation in secular Western ideas. The ideas of the Enlightenment, the ideas of freedom, the idea of individualism, and the idea of reason, more importantly than anything. And that was never the plan in Afghanistan and Iraq, we threw money at their, exist, at their existing intellectual infrastructure. We threw money at their existing schools. We threw money at their existing philosophy and views on life and views of the world. We didn't try to change those, not in a fundamental, philosophical, ideological, educational way. Yes, we allowed girls to go to school. What did they study in school? The same thing Afghans have been studying in school forever. We did not impose a curriculum. Now, after World War II, in Europe, they had somewhere to go. French, German intellectuals of the Enlightenment. They were always advocates of freedom and individualism in these countries. There were always better ideas than the Nazis and the communists in these countries. They, had, they were Western. They had somewhere to go. Now, Japan, we imposed a will on Japan. Japan didn't get to write a constitution after Japan was defeated. MacArthur wrote the constitution for them, and he modeled it after the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. imposed its will on Japan. Now, the second reason it worked in Europe and Japan is because we destroyed them. We utterly devastated them. We crushed them. We turned them into dust. I, I encourage you to read the work of... Um, God, don't let me... The name slip. Somebody will help me. Um, a, a deceased objectivist uh, scholar who wrote about World War II, who wrote about war and about what it takes to win a war uh, and, uh, and, and wrote several books about this. And they, they're unbelievably important to read. John Davis Lewis. Thank you. Jesus, I can't believe I, I, that name slipped my mind. Um, John Davis Lewis, pick up his books. They're on Amazon. Um, they're brilliant, they're excellent, and he shows how the fact that we completely and utterly devastated, devastated the Japanese and the Germans in World War II, opened them to the possibility that they were wrong, that they needed to change, made them open to new ideas. And it's only because we crushed them was that possible. So to do that in, 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 in Afghanistan would be more difficult than in Japan because Japan had even had a history of somewhat liberal democracy in the late 19th century, early 20th century. But, but it, it would be more difficult than Japan. It would have demanded us to crush the Taliban completely. And it would be more difficult than Japan because of Islam and the primitive nature of Islam. But it could have been done. It would have taken decades. It wasn't worth doing. I don't think we should have done it. But that's why it didn't work. It didn't work because there was no basis. I mean, culture is shaped by ideology. If you don't change the ideology, the culture won't change. Um, I'll just take this. Enric says, I may be mistaken, but I've done very well for decades investing in stocks I know in tech and now a bit in biotech, not diversified. I mean, good for you. Uh, you know, let's say, um, let's say the, the, the NASDAQ right now is in a bubble and it declines 50%. What kind of hit will you take? I, I mean, I, maybe you're fine. And maybe, I don't know if you were investing in those stocks in 99 in 98, 99, and then took a hit in 2000 and held on to it and recovered. 
I, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying it's unusual to be successful at it long term. And if you're going to do it, invest like Envic says, that is invest in things you actually know and understand. Companies you know and understand. Um, that's the only way to do it if you're going to do it. So you really have to know the tech. You really have to know something about the companies. You really have to believe you have some kind of advantage. By the way, when you say you've done well, very well, how well would you have done if you'd been diversified? That is, Enric, are you adjusting for, let's say, the S&P 500 or for the NASDAQ or for what a diversified portfolio did during that same period of time, right? So it, it really is a question of relative. How did you do relatively speaking? It might also be a question of, you know, luck only in the sense. You say you were in Apple around 99 and 2000 and Amazon a bit later. Yeah, I mean, if you bought Amazon in the early 2000s, you've done phenomenally well. Amazon has outperformed the rest of the world by a gazillion, right? But it didn't have to. And it's, it's tricky and it's dangerous and a lot of people can lose and do lose money. But you've got to adjust to make sure that you've actually outperformed. Um, Enric says he has not compared. Yeah, you need to compare it. And you need to compare it the day you buy, the day you sell, the return. It's complicated to compare it. It might not be worth it. And you might enjoy investing like this. But you don't know that you've done very well until you compare Ari writes, thank you, Iran. Also, I read your paper on just war theory versus American self-defense. It was eye-opening on how embedded altruism is in our culture. Uh, yes. And, and uh, I guess the previous question asked whether I think it's worse today, altruism, if it's worse today. Yeah, I think it is worse today, the altruism. I, I, I think altruism is only getting worse. What is the force that would make it less worse? I mean, and now you see it across the political spectrum naked and, and to the extent that there's some backlash against altruism overseas there's a complete embracing of sacrifice domestically so yes I think altruism is even stronger today than it was before um, again when generals like even uh, all these generals of the last 20 years are hailed by Republicans as these great generals you know, given how terrible they were, that uh, we're not in good shape. Uh, Diego says, Peacock's America versus Americans is also excellent. Absolutely. Absolutely. He, get, he nails it in that talk in terms of what's killing this country. Okay, let's keep going with Super Chats. I noticed that we, the living in Fountainhead, overlap each other in time. Is there any intended significance of this? It really puts into perspective the differences in the endings in each, given the cultures they take place in. Yes, um, I don't think there's any significance in it. It's the time in which she lived. She was writing about the time in which she lived. And, um, you know, she, uh, uh, so I don't think there's more than that. And it does say, you know, we the living has to end the way it does because it's said in Soviet Union. Fountainhead has to end the way it does because it's in the United States of America, and at the end of the day, certainly back then, in the 40s, you have to be optimistic about the United States of America. I am answering all the questions, Frank. Will you stop being so impatient? But I'm going to answer the questions that are related to the topic first, and I'm going to answer the questions that came before you. You asked yours last, and you're so impatient. God. All right. Uh, Frank's great, though, because he's always here and he always asks, so, but he is impatient. Uh, I did, what did I want to say something? Somebody said, uh, Mad Dog Mathis. Yeah, I mean, take Mad Dog Mathis, who uh, I never was very high on, and you can find shows that I did when Trump uh, uh, chose him as Secretary of Defense, and I was saying, eh, I, I never thought much of him as a general. Uh, but it was interesting that when Trump uh, uh, nominate, uh, you know, appointed him as Secretary of Defense, Republicans and everybody, oh, they thought he was God's gift to the republic. He was the greatest general who ever lived, and Trump was such a genius in choosing him. 
And then when uh, Mathis resigned or was fired and became critical of Trump, then he became the devil. And, and this is one of the indications to me, to the, those same Republicans, those same people. That became an indication to me that something about Trump and about the response to Trump is wrong, is, 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 is weird, because it happened over and over. The same thing happened to John Bolton. He was this amazing foreign policy guy as long as uh, Trump liked him. And as soon as Trump didn't like him, he became, oh, he's a neocon, he's horrible, he's terrible, he's disgusting. It was like that, that kind of flipping and, and basically taking the side of Trump no matter what he did, even on issues you were pretty firm and strong about before, that's what drove me nuts about the, the, those supporters of Trump, the Trumpists. Okay, Michael asks, is Blake Scholes a game changer? United just bought 150 supersonic airplanes. Will he be the Alex Epstein of aviation? He seems to understand objectives on a high level. I, I don't know if he's a game changer. I, 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 he might be. We will see. He still has a long um, path to go before he's, a, he's the kind of a gazillionaire where, where he can really make those changes. So far, he's not been an advocate uh, for objectivism or for any kind of political or philosophical perspective. He's just a great entrepreneur, just. He's a great entrepreneur, and he's doing amazing work, and he's creating an amazing company, and he gets full credit for that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what he does when he makes a lot of money, what he does with the money. It'll be interesting if he starts speaking out, when he starts speaking out. I'm hoping to interview Blake on the, uh, my other show, on the Ingenuism show, um, in the next few weeks, months, we will see when that happens. But that, that is the plan. The plan is to, is to try to get an interview with him. Michael asks also, do you think most intellectuals prefer Plato while the common man prefers Aristotle? I, I think the, the common man is more connected to reality. I don't think it's an issue of preferring Aristotle. I think the common man has to deal with reality in a way intellectuals don't. And therefore is more connected to reality, usually. But it doesn't matter what the common man prefers. Because the common man is insignificant. The common man doesn't determine anything. The common man is a Platonist when the intellectuals guide him towards Platonism. And the common man is an Aristotelian when the intellectuals guide him towards that area. So the common man, sadly and unfortunately, is, you know, uh, manipulated by our intellectuals. And our intellectuals are thoroughly corrupted. And the intellectuals love Plato because he allows them to deal in a floating abstract world where they don't have to deal with reality that scares them a little bit about, about it. Okay, best friend Hank asks, uh, during yesterday's show, you mentioned how you would like your channel to grow plus how you'd like Objectives Philosophy to grow. Have you tried to reach out to the gay community other than through Dave Rubin? Um, I, I don't even know how to reach out to the gay community. I mean, I, I, um, yeah, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what that would look like. I mean, obviously, Dave Rubin, a uh, number of gays work at the Institute, but, but I don't know what, how you would do that. So if you've got ideas, I'm certainly open to them. Um, Michael says, Yuan, stop saying nobody agrees with me. A lot of people agree with you and growing. All right, nobody of influence agrees with me yet. They will one day. Maybe I'll even be alive to see it. That would be very rewarding. Thank you, Michael. I, I know... More and more people are agreeing with me. It's frustrating when people, this is the thing. And foreign policy is where the rubber hits the road in some senses more than anything. It's frustrating when people are dying and people are going to die and people's lives are destroyed and devastated. And you know what the solution is. And while people agree with me, it's not a big group of people. And while the group is growing, how fast is it growing? Why isn't it growing faster? Why aren't, aren't the people who agree with me reaching positions of influence? Why is the word getting out there? Why is the fact, for example, and again, I don't want to be, I'm not just saying this out of uh, boastfulness, but why is the fact that I, I've been right about 9-11, everything I've said about 9-11 and the consequence in Iraq and Afghanistan and all this stuff, everything I said has been right. Everything we at the Anwin Institute have said has been right. And yet... That gets no traction out there, other than with you guys, but you guys, it's a small part of the universe. 
why aren't they, there were 167 people watching the world, up to 180. Why aren't they 1,600 people watching right now? Why aren't they, why isn't this issue of Afghanistan driving subscriptions to 100,000? I mean, it's probably gonna drive subscriptions down. People hate, you know, I, I lose people when I talk about this stuff. I've already got one thumbs down. But I lose people when I talk about this stuff. Maybe that one thumbs down is about Trump, right? Um, why is it that people who supported me post 9-11 then completely walked away from me and from the Institute because of Trump? It's, it's very frustrating doing intellectual work over the last 20 years. It, it just is. And you sometimes hear that frustration. Um, Ali says, I really don't understand why people place such some successful, why people place some successful in place of gods. I mean, I see that on people criticizing Elon Musk, we, uh, are we creating the future gods? Even same can apply to Trump. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I don't think this, I, I think the duration and the looking for, for, for people are looking for heroes. They're not looking for, I don't think they view Elon Musk as a god. What they're looking for is a hero. What they're looking for is somebody they can admire. What they're looking for is somebody who will stand up for them. Somebody who will stand up for, for, for the producers. Trump is different. Trump, I think, attracted people who want an authoritarian, who want a godlike figure. I, I think that was the danger of Trump, and I think he, he, he elicited that in people. But Musk, people attracted him because of uh, uh, his virtues. And, and, and they want to see heroes in the world out there. Now, I think the next show I do on, um, on Iran's Rules for Life is going to be about the need for heroes, because I think it's a real need. All right, let's run through these. Uh, Landon says, sorry, I mistyped 1970 was 1980, he says, when the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty ended after Jimmy Carter established relations with communist China. I wonder if there was a side deal signed with Taiwan that met with the I don't know. Uh, let me do some research, but thanks, Landon, for correcting me on that. 1980. Uh, Daniel says, you rock your own. Thank you. I want to begin my own objectivist group in Des Moines, Iowa. Excellent. Go for it. Uh, uh, Daniel also asks, have you, have you had Mofongo dish yet in PR? Many times. I, I'm not a huge fan of Mofongo. Uh, not my favorite food, but it, when it's done well, it's good. It's good. It's just not great, and it's it's a, it, it's it's... So I, I often pass on the mofongo uh, when I eat. Um, I had great meal tonight, great meal tonight. The restaurant called Vianda, one of my favorite restaurants, not just in Puerto Rico, but anyway, it's just, it's just got good, uh, mostly light, but good, uh, great vegetables. It, 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 it has this amazing beet salad. They have this, uh, he calls it a, a carrot tartare, carrot tartare, oh, so much flavor, so delicious, just spectacular. Um, and then I, uh, I had liver pate, I love liver, and, uh, and um, chick a chicken dish, and one other thing that I can't remember now. But, but yeah, fantastic, one of my, one of my all-time favorite restaurants. Um, Vianda, if you ever come to Puerto Rico, you gotta eat at Vianda. Frank, here's your question. Uh, this weekend was 50th anniversary of The Who. Who's next album? In light of Afghanistan's crisis, the lyric of won't get fooled again seemed apt now. Um, but we keep getting fooled. We don't learn anything from our failures. We don't learn anything from our past. We keep getting fooled over and over and over again. And, and so The Who, we're wrong. We, we, we will get fooled again, it looks like. Daniel asks, any word on the debate with Richard Wolff? Yeah, I think I said this yesterday. Um, October 12th, University of Pennsylvania. I don't have more details than that, but definitely October 12th in the city of Philadelphia, there will be the debate between me and Richard Wolff, unless COVID shuts everything down or something happens. But that is uh, pretty finals. Finals, they've already paid me half my speaker fee. So it's definitely happening. It should be, my guess is it'll be a big attendance because Richard Wolf will draw. It'll be packed with socialists and leftists and 
nuts. And hopefully a few of you will show up to support me. Um, hopefully we'll get some students at the University of Philadelphia who, who will support me. So we'll get a, a big audience. I'm, I'm hoping for several hundred in the audience, and it should be it should be a fun um, it should be a fun event. All right, I never got to talking about the one achievement. We'll do that. I'll have to edit the, the I'll have to edit that out. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for uh, being here. You you help me stay sane because I've been steaming all day, and I allowed the steam to be released. I'm I'm, I'm actually. Working on a, on a talk I have to give at, at, at OCON, at the Objectives Conference, which I hope many of you will attend. It's in Austin, Texas in two weeks. And I'm working on this, the keynote address there on OPA, on, on the significance and importance of OPA. And it's in some ways the toughest talk I've ever written. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult because how do you do justice to such an important book? And I'm, I'm doing that, and I'm steaming about what's going on in the world generally. Afghanistan is just one little thing. And then I get to do the show and yell at you guys and release all the tension. And I feel much better now. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to get back to work on that talk and nail it. So um, thank you, guys. I did not feel the earthquake in Haiti. We did not feel it here in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, we do have small earthquakes on and off. Today, oh, by the way, today was a great day for, for the fundraising, for the Super Chat team. Thank you. Ali is very happy. We, we exceeded the $600 goal that, that we had. We, we made it to $800, um, which is fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you all for contributing. I know some of you gave a lot of money early on, and that, that, that is terrific. Really, really appreciate the support. Of course, you can support the show on the iranbookshow.com slash support. You can become a monthly contributor. If you're just here for the first time, and you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Please hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so they notify you when I go live. Uh, we'll be doing uh, at least two shows this week. Uh, one of them will be on the War and Achievement. Another one will be uh, one of your on Rules for Life. Uh, and uh, don't forget to like the show before you leave now. But as we end, when you, before you leave, click the like button. That helps the algorithms uh, bring up. Hopefully, uh, Action Jackson will be releasing tomorrow morning the or, or sometime the section on Afghanistan because it seems like there's a lot of interest right now in Afghanistan. So a short video just with my rant for the first 40 minutes will, I think, do pretty well. And, um, you know, keep it up. Keep, keep up the, the, the passion and, and, and stay focused. Study objectivism. Stay focused on the ideas. Stay focused on the good. Stay focused on your life. Stay selfish. Stay self-interested. Stay caring about the value of your life. And because of that, and because you understand the role of reason in your life, this is all the impact of OPA on me. Fight for your freedom. Life isn't a gift. Life is, and it's wonderful, and it's fantastic. Don't let evil get to you. Cherish it. Live it. Embrace it. Enjoy it. Have a great night. Bye, everybody.